I'd like to read uh, Revelation chapter 15. This is our 27th sermon, believe it or not, in our series on Revelation. I'm not exactly sure how many we have to go, but uh, I want to talk to you after I read this passage about what is really at the center, what's at the core, what's at the heart of this book. Hear the word of God. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them, the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of, go of, of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this, I looked, and the sanctuary of the Ten of Witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. The word of God for our encouragement and our growth in grace. Our Father, we pray that you would show us what we are to learn from this text of Scripture. We look at some of these passages and we wonder what it's about. And we thank you that that question can be answered. Lord, give us hearts of worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here it is. At the heart of the book of Revelation is the worship of Jesus. You notice how Revelation moves back and forth between earth and heaven, between the broken and the mended, between judgment and safety. We've just, we've just seen the ugly reality of judgment to come. Jesus said, we reap what we sow. So to the flesh, we will reap judgment. So to the spirit, we will be saved. Last week, Andrew showed us the two harvests in chapter 14, drawn from the parable of the wheat and the weeds told by Jesus in Matthew 13. The first harvest is the wheat harvest, depicting the gathering in of the people of God. The second harvest shows the gathering up of the wicked for destruction. It is the grape harvest of the wrath of God. As chapter 15 begins, we move again to heaven. Just when we are overwhelmed with the grief and the suffering that we see, we get to go where it is peaceful and safe, where it is holy and where it is good. And that is in the presence of God. We see those gathered in who are worshiping around the throne. And we are reminded again of the big plan of God to rescue this world from sin and death and destruction. The vision of heaven and the worship of God are in this context of making everything new. God will bring about the end of suffering. Sin is going to be stopped once and for all. You know, there's much about this world we live in which is beautiful, like an exotic destination place or a warm spring day. 
We love movies like It's a Wonderful Life. We can get all teary. They show us the best of human nature, but for all that is good, we know reality carries with it a great deal of pain that even It's a Wonderful Life can't cover up. We know what sin has done to mar what God has made. This is why we have locks on our doors and 911 on our speed dial. This is why there are police, jails, soldiers, wars, and missile launchings. This is why there are explosions that blow away arms and legs when we never expected it. We applaud the wonderful people who rush to the aid of the dying and the injured, but the horrible reality of terrorism is still with us. We live in a world where children are shot in a drug deal gone bad. Abuse, abortion, sex trafficking, divorce, and lawyers are all a part of our world marred by sin. No one wants to call it that, but this is the reality. We live in a world of broken beauty. Beautiful, yes, but broken. And we can talk as Christians about both parts. The beauty of his creation and the broken beauty of sin and what Jesus has done to fix it. Every one of us wants all of this trouble to end. We want the hungry fed and the homeless to find shelter. We want to protect the weak. We want our children to be safe. There's something inside of all of us that tells us that we were made for more. This is not the way things were meant to be. We want to look in a lot of places to find relief. Perhaps world religion with its call to toleration will provide the answer. Let's just all get along, dig deeper, let's sing, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me, but it doesn't work. Perhaps reincarnation is the answer. We can come back better the next time. Perhaps evolution holds the answer. After all, we are still animals. But in a million years, we will evolve to a higher life form. I don't know about you, but I can't wait that long. Perhaps hedonism is the right approach. Listen, just live for the pleasures of life when they come. They will deaden the pain. Well, Revelation tells us where to go for the solution. There is a God who made us and a God who would not abandon us to our sin. This is why Jesus came, to deliver us from the sin and the pain. The answer does not lie, and it never did lie, in us trying to make ourselves better. It lies with God, whose purpose is to make everything new. There are two words that I've used to describe the book of Revelation. Jesus wins. But let me suggest two more words. Worship God. Worship God. Revelation, you see, is not about barcodes and tracking chips. It's not about the League of Nations, the Battle of Armageddon, the identity of the Antichrist, or the rapture. There it is, 27 sermons, and I mentioned the rapture for the first time. It's not about that. It's not about the mark of the beast. At the heart of Revelation is the beauty of worship in a broken world. We cry out with the saints around the throne, How long, O oh God? When will you come? When will it end? Do you care? Do you see? Yes, you do. You do, Father, and you will come. The Lord will stand with the 144,000 who represent all of God's people, redeemed by the Lamb. And before He comes, dear friends, He sends out His angels to proclaim the Gospel. The Gospel of our God. It is the last call. There is still time. All those who respond are tied up in the harvest of life. All those who do not respond will perish. On this day, we stand before the throne. It is a place of worship. We are in a safe place when we ascend into heaven with our minds and our hearts fixed on Jesus Christ. We are in a safe place when we worship. All of us worship something. If you're worshiping something other than Jesus Christ, you are deceived. You are on perilous ground. 
But if you worship Jesus Christ, if you come as you are with your brokenness, with your sin, with your pain, and say, Jesus, deliver me from it all, you will be saved. Here's the theme. We worship the God who delivers us from the judgment we deserve and who brings down judgment on the world. Do you uh, ever struggle with judgment? We, we, we recoil from it, don't we? We, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to, want to see it. It sounds so barbaric. Listen, my friends, last week and this week, blood is flowing from your Bible. This is not about jihad. We do not attack the enemies of God. We love our enemies and we invite them in while there's still time. God will fight his own battles. Thank you very much. He will rise from his throne and he will come. Today we are near him and that is where I want to be. And we are given reason to worship. We worship God because he will intervene. He is neither impotent nor incompetent. He is all holy and almighty. We want God to intervene, don't we? We want God to take away sickness and death and evil. This is a cause to celebrate. He loves us too much to allow it to continue. Listen to me. People say we want God to do away with sickness, death, and evil. We just don't want him to deal with sinners. Take away all that is bad. Just don't interfere with my lifestyle and what I want to do. And God will not deal with sin without dealing with the sinner. God will not deal with sin without dealing with the sinner. Listen, you will either be stopped in your tracks here and your life will be totally transformed by Jesus Christ or he will stop you on that day when he stands up from his throne and he comes and you will be cast out of his presence forever yes there is a day of judgment how old-fashioned is that it's in the word the question is will you be standing with God's people on the inside or will you be on the outside receiving the full fury of his wrath. I want you to notice as we talk about worship, first of all, the scene of this worship in verse 2. I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. There's a sea of glass and fire, and it's separating us from God. This is not a, a frozen lake. Uh, they didn't have frozen lakes in that part of the world. It means that he is apart from us. Verse 4 tells us that he is holy, that he is to be feared. There is a great distance between us as we are and God as he is. We do not come to him until he bids us come. That certainly is there, transcendence, but there's something else. We, we go back to the deliverance of Israel from, from Egypt. There is a sea of glass. The people in bitter slavery long to be set free. And you remember, God sent Moses to lead them out. And he sent his plagues on Egypt. And we are going to look at the plagues over the next couple of weeks. The people are delivered after the tenth plague. That was God's most devastating blow. Not until the firstborn dies will the people be set free. Those who escape the plague of death are covered by the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost. And now they have left Egypt and they are gathered at the Red Sea with nowhere else to go. The Egyptians have changed their mind. They want to bring the people back. And God parts the sea just at the right time and the people walk through on dry land. But they are still not safe. The Egyptians begin to 
plow through the same pathway that God had made for the people of Israel. The Egyptians rush through the parted waters and then God does the amazing thing. He collapses the wall of water and the enemy is drowned. You see the picture here of still waters. Peaceful waters again. He leads me by the, the still waters as if nothing happened. The Red Sea becomes a sea of glass beneath which God's enemies are buried. And why is this sea of glass mingled with fire? 2 Peter 3 tells us why. Scoffers will come at the last day denouncing the plan of God, making fun of the coming of God, even as they did in the days of Noah. 100 years he's building this crazy ark, and there's not a cloud in the sky, and it keeps waiting and waiting and waiting, and people are mocking and scorning Noah and the God of heaven. Where is the promise of judgment? He will not act. Peter says, listen, they have forgotten that God destroyed the water by a flood. The flood in Genesis. And later, it was water that was used to destroy the Egyptians. Water is a symbol of God's judgment. And the day is coming when he will act again. By the sure word of his promise, the heavens and the earth are stored up for fire. The sea and the fire in this heavenly vision are reminders to us that we are saved. They are reminders to us of that from which we have been spared. The water of judgment and the fire of judgment will not harm us. And we can gather at the throne of the judge safe and secure from all alarm. Notice the people of worship. They are not wearing the mark of the beast. They are those whose lives bore witness to the reality of Jesus Christ and his saving work. They did not falter but remained faithful through the trials and temptations and suffering of life. And notice our text tells us that all of the nations will come and worship you in verse 4. He is the God whose mercies extend as far as his judgments those from other lands who suffer for the name of Christ will be there. Those who suffer more than we ever have. The people whose churches were burned down will be there. The women who were raped and abused for their faith will be there. Our brothers who, and sisters who counted the cost will be there. And they will be singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. And let's look at that song of worship in verses 2 and 3. I, uh, those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name were standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. They're given a harp. Those of you who are not musical, you will be musical. You will go varsity. There is a melody to play. You are given a gift you never had before, and you sing the song of salvation. It's the song of Moses. And what is the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb? My mind immediately went to three places in the Bible. Let me tell you what they were. The first is the psalm written by Moses, Psalm 90, and you can go back and look at it one day or this day. God is worshipped as, as our dwelling place in every generation. And this is the God who later in the chapter brings down judgment. What? You mean there's a connection between worship and judgment? You bet there is. Gain a life of wisdom, Moses says, before God comes to cast you away from his presence. <laughs> Exodus 15 is the second place where we look, and we read part of that in, in our passage this morning. Moses wrote a great song on the other side of the sea. The enemy is cast into the sea, and they don't take a moment of silence to remember the dead. 
They sing and they dance in the worship of God who triumphs gloriously. The horse and the rider he's hurled into the sea. Your enemies, O God, you have dealt with and your dealing with your enemies is holy and just and true. The third place is Deuteronomy 32. And there Moses writes of God's great love to Israel. There's a word of warning. If you desert this God, you will be judged. And he says in Deuteronomy 32, after ascribing all glory to God, he says, I will heap disaster on you. You shall be wasted with hunger, devoured by plagues and poisonous pestilence. Boy, pastor, thanks for the encouragement. This is, this is hard stuff. This is God's judgment on this world. And it's high time the world began to hear it again. It's high time we heard it again. Because we do not want you to be deceived by thinking that you are all right because you are here. Unless you are covered by the Lamb, there's judgment awaiting you. And now they sing this new song. They sing the song of Moses, but now there is no threat of falling away. Deuteronomy 32 cannot happen. Be careful that you do not fall away. These people singing around the throne are singing with great joy because it's finally over. My battle with sin is gone. I will never walk away. God has brought me here. He's keeping me safe, and I will not fall away. There are no beasts here. There are no plagues and no pestilence in this place. The song of Moses is the song of the Lamb, for one greater than Moses has come to assure us that never again will there be sin or sorrow or suffering. And then notice with me the content of the worship again in verses 3 and 4. This is not a, an emotional... Um, uh, look into heaven. This is a, this is a content filled. It's a, it's a, it's a mental, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intelligent look into heaven that moves the heart and moves the will. Great and amazing are your deeds. These are objective truths. These are realities that we can state as the reason for our worship. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nation. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? Who, indeed? Let me ask you, is there anyone in this sanctuary within the sound of my voice who would say, I will not fear him or glorify his name? Who will? Will you? Say amen. Amen. Great and marvelous are your deeds. Just and true are your ways. How great it is to be delivered from sin and death. If he is just and true, if he is just and true as he says he is, he sees things as they are. He is the perfect eyewitness to everything. His testimony cannot be overruled or thrown out. There will never be DNA evidence that suggests that he arrested the wrong man. There will never be an unsolved crime in God's criminal justice system. It is all right and just and fair and good, and every mouth will be closed before him. This is the God who is to be feared and to be worshipped. Who will not fear and glorify your name? Let me say one thing about this. Here's, here's the core of worship. There is the joy, and there's the music, and there is the mind that's focused on the greatness of God. You see, worship is not about you. And we need to be reminded of this. It is about Him. Worship is not about what you get out of it. It's about what you give. I don't want to hear anybody say, I never got anything out of worship. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to give worship. You are not here to be entertained by a pastor who speaks to you or by musicians who sing. You are not the audience. 
You are the participants, and you are participating in something where there is a where there is a, a an audience of one, and it's God. And so, quite frankly, I don't care if you liked the worship. What I'm more concerned about is if God receives it, and I would rather answer to Him than to you. What else does this song say? Your righteous acts have been revealed. Yes, they have. We know that we are here today because of His righteousness, not our own. We have no goodness of our own. We never did and we never will. Jesus came with all the goodness anyone could ever need and we killed Him. And when he, we killed him, he took our sins and he gave us his righteousness. That's how much he loved us. Because of him, because of his death and his resurrection, we are safe. It is all true. We did not believe in vain. His righteousness is all we can claim. It's not how good we are. It's who we know. Thank you, Jay, for that reminder a little earlier. Well, I'm going to stop in just a moment. I want to say one word about the judgment or the wrath of God. I'm going to look at this next week. But I want you to see how the chapter begins. This is a context of worship. And it's worship in the reality of a broken world. Do you see? Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. The pledge of judgment leads to the praise of Jesus. Why is that? Because, you see, the judgment we deserve has been put on another. With these seven bowls, the final curtain is drawn. That which we long for will come, and that which the enemies of God ridicule will come. And every tear will be wiped away. It is finally finished. The word for finish means consummation. The word is telos. And in a Greco-Roman play, the word telos was the final scene in the last act. If the Greco-Roman world of that day made movies, they wouldn't say the end, they would say telos. And it's really for us not the end, is it? It's just the new beginning. The close of history is known as the soon telos. It refers to everything connected to the end times. Where have you heard this word before it is finished? Well, you know, don't you? It was on the cross. Jesus said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he died. What was finished? What was finished? The ultimate sacrifice was made. The work of redemption was accomplished. There is no longer any need for the continued sacrifice of lambs for the forgiveness of sin. Those sacrifices performed by an endless line of priests pouring out the blood of millions of lambs were never enough to pay for all the sins we have committed. What was finished? The debt we owe was finished. That word tell us was stamped on a bill of sale as receipt of full payment. It's done. You don't have to give me any more. By his death, the wages of sin have been paid. Jesus paid it all. What was finished? Well, if you have rested in Christ, the holy wrath of God against your sin has been taken away. The warfare with God is finished. For on the cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Well, there's only one more thing left to say. There are seven bowls ready to be poured out. One bowl is not enough to contain the holy wrath of God against the sins of this world. So much anger resides with God through the course of human history.
Sinners have been warned for thousands of years. Noah called men to repent, to enter the ark of safety. Judgment was coming, and men ran in the other direction, and they've been running ever since. Sinners have been running from God for thousands of years. God, do away with trouble, but don't do away with the troublemakers. And God can only say, I cannot do the one without the other. My holy justice will be satisfied. The bowls are even now being lifted. And the terror attacks and the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the shootings in school and the bombs at marathons are a wake-up call. They, they are like the, 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 the drops spilling over the rim from the bowls as the angels carry them out of the sanctuary. Judgment's coming. Are you ready? Either Jesus took God's wrath for you or you will take it upon yourself. Do I make the word of God clear? Either Jesus took your wrath that you deserve, took the judgment for you, or you will bear it yourself. And if he has taken it from you, that should fill your mouth and your heart with great praise. Run through the door of safety before God closes it forever. His patience is running out. His love is offered in Jesus. Run through the door and stand with those by the sea of glass and worship Him whose righteous acts have been revealed. Amen. Or should I say, tell us. Lord God, have mercy upon Your church. And Lord, if the bowls are even now being lifted, as we come to the end of time, I don't know when it is, nobody in this room knows when it is. And we keep asking the question, how long? And we follow up by saying, I don't know, but it, but it will come. It will come when you, when you say it will come. So Lord, may we be ready and may we go forth as the angels did with the gospel of God, telling our world about the profound love the great and marvelous deeds of our God, that He is just and holy, and He's provided a way for us to be with Him forever. Who would not fear and worship Your name? May it be so. In